Good morning. Good to see everybody. I thought we had another verse in that song, so I was, thought I had a little bit more time to get my breath, so that's all right. Um, thanks for the opportunity to preach to you again, and it's a blessing to hear about souls being saved through the camp ministry. It makes it all worth it, being a single parent for one week. I know, bring out the violin that my... <laughs> My wife left me, so. Um, but no, it's excellent, excellent ministry, and we pray for the growth of those ones that got saved. Okay, so we're going to start our reading in First Thessalonians chapter five, verse eleven. It reads, "Wherefore comfort yourselves together." And edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labour among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, support the weak. Be patient toward all men. So join me, we'll pray for the message. Dear Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this day. We thank you for our church. Most of all, we thank you for you, for your person, for your son Jesus Christ, for salvation through him. We do thank you for giving us your revelation through the word of God. And we do pray now that you might just help us to just put aside this time to try and focus as best as we can. We need the Holy Spirit's help, Father. Please let the word of God sink into our hearts and guide me as I share what I've learned. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as you can tell, today I'm continuing my series in 1 Thessalonians and we're getting near the end. Um, In my last message, we spent quite a bit of time looking at church leadership, not specifically the role of church leadership, although it was in there. It was more so about our role of of us that are not in, I guess, church leadership, about how we are to treat them, how we are to understand their ministry, how we're not meant to take them for granted. It says in verse 12 to verse 13, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labour among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. As we look down in the very next verse, in verse 14, we read, Now we exhort you, brethren. Here Paul turns his attention back to the faithful Christians who made up the church in Thessalonica. Paul then commands these Christians to take up the ministry of discipling one another in the local church. And he does this by listing three categories of Christians with varied needs. Now, if you've been around church long enough, you'll realise we're not all the same. (laughs) Now, that is a blessing. Um, You know, we're not clones. We are sheep, but we're not exactly the same sheep. And we have different, you know, different personalities, and we also struggle with different things. Well, Paul lists these three categories of Christians with varied needs. And Paul gives each group of people a specific diagnosis is what I've I've called it and then with this diagnosis he gives them a tailored recommendation for the rest of the church to disciple them. The three categories or diagnoses that Paul gives are the unruly, the feeble-minded and the weak. You probably tell I work in a hospital that's why I'm using the words diagnosis but um, anyway easy to remember. Today we're going to consider Paul's advice for discipling this one category of Christians, the unruly. And I've entitled my message, Directions for Discipleship, because this is just going to be part A. Uh, We're going to look at the other categories of people, Lord willing, at other times. So my outline is broken down in two parts. One, the diagnosis, and two, the discipleship. The first category of people Paul diagnosed, as I mentioned, was the unruly. It says in verse 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of unruly, I think of all different, all different types of things. I think of an unruly child that's just 
bouncing here and there, and it's like, wow, that kid's unruly. Or it could be an adult <laughs> that acts like a child. They could be 40 years old, but is just wild and getting into all types of vices. But really, the word unruly, when it's translated from the Greek term, means one who reviews, refuses commands given by their authority figure. So you can have people do that without an authority figure, per se. But in this case, Paul uses this, this term unruly specifically to refer to those who refuse the commands by their authority figures. And it follows quite nicely onto the previous verses where we talked about church leadership. One example of unruly behaviour is actually seen in Paul's follow-up letter to the Thessalonians. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we know that he wrote another letter called Second Thessalonians. We're going to have a look there. This book outlines Paul's commands to this same group of unruly people and also to those other people that are around them. If we read from verse 6 in chapter 3, so Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. We can really see there was a pattern of this behaviour. Paul wrote, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. That word disorderly is also unruly. And not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly or unruly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labour and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly or unruly, working not at all, but are busybodies. So from this passage, we see that Paul had clearly given the church commands around the importance of work, which some had disobeyed, and that's why he was calling them unruly. So when Paul diagnosed this group, he was referring to those persistently rejecting his commands for one aspect of Christian living. We know work is just one aspect, but it's pretty important. You know, the first man was designed to work, and, you know, the second man, second Adam, Jesus Christ worked. He was a carpenter, so great example. Now, I understand people, um, you know, some people can't work with different Ill you know, illnesses and different reasons and things like that. Uh, and that's explained more in a previous message I did on work for the Christian. But here Paul is referring to this unruly bunch and he's given a specific example of their unruliness. But it was not only disobedience to a reasonable command, it was not only sin, it had greater ramifications than the people probably even realised. By refusing Paul's command to work, the unruly hindered the church's financial support of missionaries. Jump over to Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Paul wrote, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church, that includes Thessalonica, communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Secondly, the unruly behaviour hindered the church's financial support of its own pastor. We read the very next verse. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity unto Paul's necessity. So the Philippians had to support Paul while he was in Thessalonica because the unruly was unruly. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't doing that one aspect, that one aspect of obeying Paul's command. Now, they probably didn't realise this, that, you know, the larger ramifications, but that's the point. Thirdly, the unruly placed a greater burden on their church leadership Jump over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8.
Paul wrote this, Neither did we, that is Paul and Silas, eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labour and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. They were like working 24-7 because of this unruly bunch. They were getting exhausted. They could not wholly devote themselves to the ministry. They had to take on other jobs. Sadly, this happens in some churches and throughout the other places in the world. Some, some, um, some mission fields, they don't adequately support their pastors. So churches that are, that are more well off can have to support them. The other, the other hindrance was that the unruly hindered the church's testimony to the unsaved. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, it says, And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we, Paul and Silas, commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, that's the unsaved, and that ye may have lack of nothing. So this one, this one aspect of the Christian life, work, when, when there was a group of people that were being unruly, unruly, that they were refusing to obey Paul's commands, had far greater implications for the mission of the church. It wasn't just that, you know, it just affected their family, but I imagine it did if they were poor, especially in the early church. You know, they didn't have Centrelink. But there was all those other things going on. It was bad testimony. It affected the local sustainability of the church. It affected other less fortunate missions or missionaries uh, that needed support. They had to rob, per se, from other churches to support ones where they should have been more supported. Now, today's message is not about tithing, although you can take something about that if you need it. It's, it's more about uh, this category of people in, in any aspect of the Christian life that refuses to obey a command from the scripture that they have been taught and they continue to do so. Now, any of us can fall into the category of being the unruly, just as the Thessalonians did. I include myself in that. I'm not being high and mighty. Um, there's, there's, sums, there's like real estate to our Christian life, right? But we'll keep this part over here to ourselves. And as we read about the testimony of the Thessalonians, they had a lot going for them. They had a testimony that went throughout all Macedonia. They had so much going for them. They were a very strong church. And that's why I'm actually enjoying uh, studying the book, because it's an ideal, ideal example of a church. But there was this group, and it was a group, there was more than one. If you read through the Greek, the unruly is in the plural. There was more than one person that were unruly, and they kept one part of their Christian life, their employment, and their work, uh, they, they kept that off limits to the Lord. So for us, it may have nothing to do with employment, but we may continue refusing the commands which are preached or practiced by our spiritual leaders. Perhaps the word of God has been speaking to you or I about something needing to change for some time. But we continue to hold on to the idea that we know best despite it clearly being in opposition to scripture. And likewise, we probably don't realize the bigger picture. Like this unruly probably didn't realize the bigger picture the bigger picture of the church mission and how it affects others. And that's sin, isn't it? It's selfish. And we have a narrow mindset and all we're thinking about is us and the thing in front of us. And we don't think about how it affects others. We don't really think about how it affects the Lord, how it affects our family, how it affects our friends, our testimony. Big ramifications. Regardless, what we see here is that the word of God takes it seriously when the unruly behave the way they do. And as I mentioned, there were multiple people engaged in this behavior and there were multiple other people affected. And for this reason alone, Paul writes that the other people in the church, not just the leadership, were responsible for affecting some change. And that's what we read in, in verse 14, chapter 5, verse 14 of the first book of First Thessalonians. Now we exhort you, brethren, not you, brother. We exhort you, brother, you've got to do it all. <laughs> no, you, brethren. That's me, that's you. Having diagnosed the severity of this problem, the severity of being unruly, Paul then advised the type of dis discipleship that would be needed. So 
So who should give the warning? We see that in the verse. Brethren. Back in, and this is the brethren besides the unruly. <laughs> Back in chapter 1, verse 5, sorry, um, chapter 5, verse 12, it says that a responsibility of the church leadership was to admonish or give the biblical warnings. Read it again. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labour among you and over in the Lord and admonish. That word admonish is the same as warn and admonish you. Now in verse 14, Paul says that this admonishment also falls to us as the church body. But this time Paul says it's our role and this really reflects the biblical idea of a proper functioning church. You know, you're not, it's not meant to have people in leadership or even just a small group in the church doing the ministry. The, the church leadership are gifted to equip the saints, equip the saints to perfect affect the saints for the edifying of the body of Christ. And we read that in Ephesians 4.11. Let's jump over there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. As Christians, we're not just meant to be spoon-fed throughout our entire Christian life. There's a purpose to coming on Sunday, and it's actually to be equipped. It's training ground. Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for edifying other saints, for building up saints. That's a key part of our job, a Christian's job, not just the pastors. That's everyday Christians. We are meant to be co-laborers with our pastors to edify the saints. And in turn, we'll be edified as well. If we have a church of strong, strong Christians that are built up, they'll, it'll, go, it'll be reciprocal, won't it? And I've experienced that. I've experienced other Christians edifying me and building me up, and I'm very grateful. I haven't come to a, a church where it's just the pastor and then <laughs> there's a church full of you know, very spiritually mature Christians. No, I've actually experienced uh, Christians that edify me. However, there can be barriers for any Christian who dares to do such work, don't they? Isn't there? Anyone who tries to admonish another Christian, it can be a little bit confrontational. It's, you know, you start talking about things like, you know, in the world you talk about, you know, death and mental illness and it's all scary. Sometimes in the church you talk about sanctification and admonishment and it gets all scary. And unless you've got, you know, a real close friend or a partner, you can talk about those things, but... Sometimes you get bitten. The reality is some Christians don't like being warned or admonished about their faith. They may tolerate, such as today, they may tolerate some general warning, as long as it's from a distance from the pulpit. And even if the warning is delivered with care, they can become defensive. And if this is you, I encourage you to spend some time looking at Ephesians 4. Not only that, spend some time looking at the design of the church throughout the rest of the New Testament, which talks about it's a body. Church is a body. It's, a, it's an organism. It's, um, it's designed to edify other Christians as well as reach the lost. But for those who are giving the warnings in this church, there are other things that can hinder this ministry. We know that the Corinthian church was in a terrible state. They were not really in a place to be giving admonishment to one another because they were so car carnal. And a Christian who lives in defiance of the Lord's will is not suitable to be warning others who are unruly. We don't have to be, you know, perfect A-grade Christians. I don't know any that are. Um, the only perfect one is Christ. But if we are willingly disobeying the commands of scripture and the commands of our pastors that are based in scripture we're not suitable to be warning others so that's a warning to us don't go around warning others if you're not in a good place yourself but then there are churches and there are christians that are spiritually mature as i mentioned and these ones are able to warn one another this is because christians in those churches know their bible 
Paul wrote this to the brethren in the church at Rome. Romans 15, 14 reads, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish or warn one another. Why were they able? They were full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. They were full with doctrine. They would understand their Bible enough that they were able to warn people with a basis for their warning. It wasn't just about, you know, preferences. Uh, it was about what the scriptures say. Paul also encouraged the mature Christians at Colossae to perform this ministry of warning one another. One another. Colossians 3.16 reads, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing or warning one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then as we come back to our text, what does Paul say? He says that the Thessalonians were to do this warning. If we're to give any warning whatsoever, it needs to be based in scripture. And it needs to be a standard. Otherwise, we'll come up with all wacky ideas. You know, I'll come up with ideas about, you know, what to warn people about and your, your ones will be different and they'll change as culture changes. But we need to base it in scripture. We need to put on our own oxygen mask first as well. We need to make sure that we're reading the scriptures. We, we, um, we can't expect to, just because we're a Christian and we've sat in church, if we're not abiding in Christ, as was mentioned this morning, abiding in the scriptures, then we're not in a good place to be warning or discipling other Christians. So having seen that spiritually mature Christians should give warnings, let's now consider what way should the warning be given. And we know a warning can be delivered in various ways. It can be very honest, without tact, but it may belittle a person, right? <laughs> go up to him and just go, bang, and just sledgehammer. You just feel, you know, make them feel crushed. And you've probably struggled with that same issue at some point in your life. So, you know, just be careful of throwing stones. Alternatively, a warning can be so soft and fluffy that its main point is missed altogether. So it may be legitimate, but when delivered in the wrong way, it's either useless or causes harm. If we look at this word warn, it is nutheto, nutheteo. It means to put something in one's mind by giving an accurate but gentle warning. So it's accurate, it's honest, it's truthful, but it's also gentle. An example of this is seen in the way Paul warned the Thessalonians about the unruly in the church. Now, it's not so much mentioned in the first book, but it's in the second book. And we've, we looked at these scriptures a little bit earlier. We'll jump back there. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 again. As we look at this, we'll first see that Paul's warning was very clear. He called the behaviour for what it is. It was unruly. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother, brother that walketh disorderly or unruly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly or unruly. He's calling it unruly. He's not tiptoeing around the issue. There's a problem there. When Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians, he didn't evade the issue at hand. At the same time, he was compassionate. His warning was based in care. Paul cared too much about the church, including the unruly, to pass up the opportunity to continue giving this warning, where it was required, that is. In fact, this was needed because of what is recorded about the history of the unruly people in the Thessalonian church. So it wasn't a one-off thing. It was a pattern of it that existed before. Um, so we know that Paul and Silas started the church at Thessalonica and at that initial time when they were there in person, they were addressing this issue. We know that by 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. He says that they commanded them in the past. It was past tense. He had already addressed this issue. 
And then likewise, as time passed, as they sent Timothy to do a follow-up on the church, and then later as they sent another book or another letter to the church, it was still a problem. But still, there was some compassion in the way Paul presented the warning and the way that he encouraged the Christians to do likewise. If we jump down to verse 13, he actually encourages those that are doing well to keep doing so. It says, but ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. You're doing the right thing, keep doing that. Which is another thing. If you see someone doing the right thing, <laughs> they're the opposite to unruly, encourage them because that's what we want. We want more of it. And he encourages that. But from verse 14, Paul gives instructions for the Christian brethren on how they should respond to, to those that might remain unruly. Verse 14 reads, If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish or warn him as a brother. So if they continue, despite the warning, bring this you know, down to, to application for us. If you're you know, warning someone and they continue to do it, what are we to do? We're to note them. We're to note that that's an unruly person. Okay, we know that there's a problem there. And we know that sometimes that can spread to others. And then they can become a group. And it become an un unruly group like happened in this very good church. The other thing is we need to do is to not company with them. They're not to be our best buds. We're not, we're not to completely treat them like a leper. <laughs> but we're not to spend all our time with them. Because you become like them. That's the risk. Thirdly, we're not to regard them as an enemy. I believe this is a Christian group. The unruly is a Christian group, just like the other groups in this passage that Paul is talking about. We're not to regard them as an enemy. Why? Because they're a brother or a sister. We're to regard them as such. When we warn them, we are to treat them like Christian family. It's obviously Paul cared about these ones he was still warning and he wants us to do likewise so whenever we spot an issue a significant issue you know it's not it's got to be like in scripture and and you know it's got to have some basis for it i don't want us to all go away after, after this and go warning everyone like that'd be awkward but it's got to be significant and it was significant in the example that we looked at but if we do ever give warnings they should be clear and they should be compassionate. As a side point, the way Paul writes the word warn, it's actually put in the present tense and imperative mood. Now, I wasn't very good at English, so I'll just do my best. This means to continue to do an action or to do it repeatedly. This means Paul's instruction was to continue or keep on warning your Christian brethren or re repeat as required. I think of the shampoo bottle, you know. Repeat is required. So you don't, you don't do it if it's not required. But if it's necessary, if there's still an unruly bunch or an unruly person, that's, then you repeat it. You continue it. So it's got to be clear, compassionate, and then continued as necessary. So today we just looked at this first category of Christians and how we might disciple them. Paul diagnosed them as the unruly and he also recommended discipleship that majors on warning, a warning that is clear, compassionate and continued if necessary. I'm going to look at the other categories of people at other times, Lord willing. There's also the feeble-minded and the weak. And we can all probably fit into these different categories at times if we're honest. They're not fixed personality types per se. Otherwise, why would Paul bother telling people to intervene? I think he does so because he believes that people can change. I believe people can change. <laughs> they can. Christ believes people can be sanctified. That's why we have the scriptures and that's why we have a church to assist that. We have scriptures, we have the spirit, and then we have saints. And they, those three are very essential ingredients for changing people. So this is why Paul encouraged faithful Christians 
to disciple this category of people. And we can all benefit from this. So we'd like to close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you for the guidance it gives us for various aspects of life, from work to loving others, to eternity, and also to just practical daily living and how we interact with other Christians to help them build, up, build them up, Father. And I do pray that you might help us to go away understanding more about how you would have us to treat those people that might fall into this category. And help us to not be too afraid of warning. It can be done carefully, uh, but help us to be also clear in the way we do get, deliver our warnings to people that may be living in an unruly fashion. And Father, we thank you for your church. We pray that you continue to build up the saints here and help us to continue the ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.